Mr. Drew Evans. Uh, Vanessa, raise your hand. She's our timekeeper, so as you come up to the podium, she will keep you honest. Uh oh, Tim is supposed to go back on the whole part. Yeah, he's up there agreeing with everything that I say. I just want you to know that I'm the one who said that's loud enough. Uh, <laughs> It's, it's great to be here, and I thank you for the invitation and the opportunity to visit with you a little bit, and also thank you for what you do. You know, we wouldn't be attracting industry, business, or expansion of, or of any kind whatsoever if they didn't have places to live. So uh, thank you for making that possible. Thank you for making growth possible. Now it's up to those, uh, those of us who are up here talking to you today to tell you how that growth is going to be accomplished. Uh, if you don't know me, I grew up in Muscogee. I was a 10-year DA uh, over in Muscogee. I went to Northeastern State uh, for my undergraduate, Tulsa University for law school. Enlisted in the United States Navy and did uh, three and a half years, good, uh, three and a half years in the Navy, including a tour of duty in Vietnam. Uh, real happy to be here. Uh, oh, I did the 16 years as Attorney General, too. I thought I throw that in. I uh, really enjoyed during my time as Attorney General taking the apparatus of government and put it to work to solve problems. We did that with the creation of the Tobacco Trust, did that with the creation of the Oklahoma Education uh, Technology Trust, and I enjoyed the opportunity uh, to think outside the box, to think creatively and figure out how we could solve problems at, at the state level. Uh, since the time is limited, let me get right into the questions that were asked. Uh, one is about economic development and our plan for growth. To me, uh, the plan for growth is relatively simple. And I take my cue from Roy Williams here in Oklahoma City, uh, who does economic development for the chamber, and uh, his counterpart, uh, Mike Neal, over in Tulsa. And both of them have told me the same thing. They've talked to corporate CEOs about moving to Oklahoma and get the rhetorical question, why should we invest in Oklahoma when you're not? And so I think the answer to that question is, we are. We're going to be. I think it's essential that we get our fiscal house in order and start developing this state by funding education, health, mental health, transportation, the other needs of state government, bringing down the prison population, uh, which is at a dangerous level. And then we can tell corporate America and existing businesses, so don't locate a branch office in another state, grow here in Oklahoma. And to companies that are out of state, come to Oklahoma, exciting things are happening here, come and grow with us. If we fail to do that, if we fail to move forward as a state, uh, then we're going to slide further into the hole than we've slid over the last seven and a half years. We've had our bond rating reduced because of billion dollar deficits year after year in the state of Oklahoma, and that's not good for any of us. But having our bond rating reduced is not as bad as the story I saw on the front page of the Oklahoman yesterday, which said that our life expectancy has gone down in the state of Oklahoma. Now, our bond rating is one thing, but when we start losing years off our life expectancy, that's something else. We've got to move forward, and today, this year, is the time to decide what direction we're going to move in the state of Oklahoma. Thank you. 30 seconds left. Challenges for funding, where are we going to go for the money? I still believe the gross production tax should be at 7%, not 5, not 4, not 2 but at 7%. The cigarette tax should go to $1.50. I would favor that even if we did not have a budget problem as a public health issue. The higher the price of cigarettes, the fewer kids start smoking, and that's good for everybody. Our kids and grandkids will live longer, healthier lives uh, if we boost the price of a pack of cigarettes. I would opt into the Medicaid expansion which we failed to do and in my opinion was the worst deliberate decision of government uh, in my lifetime. 
We have left 180,000 Oklahomans without medical coverage and put hospitals and nursing homes at risk in every part of rural Oklahoma in particular. We've got to do it. We've got to move our state forward. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next on the list, we have... It is you. <laughs> For those of you who don't know, this is Gary Jones. My brother from another mother. <laughs> he is currently our auditor inspector. Gary, thank you very much. And, and Gary, thank you for being such a good guy. And there's about three different other Gary Joneses I know that are great guys, and it's really good for me. So thank you very much. Uh, I'm state auditor, but let me tell you a little bit about myself. I, I'm the kid that washed dishes at 14. At 15, I was the head night cook. At 18, I went to work for Bell Telephone as an operator. By 20, I was a manager of 120 operators. 21, I was off working in the Office of Management and Budgets doing independent cost studies. At 28, I started my own company with a part, high school kid and built up to 50 employees before I ever got involved in politics. And I, I became a, I was chair of the Republican Party for six and a half years and took us from minorities to super majorities because I have a history of going in, identifying problems, and getting things done. And that's what we need. I, I became a state auditor in 2011. And instead of, everybody said, here's this guy that's the chairman of the Republican Party, he's going to fire all the Democrats and bring in a bunch of Republicans. I said, what I did was, is we gave everybody a chance. I brought in a guy that had 25 years experience to be a deputy auditor. He was a Democrat, he replaced a Republican. I was a Republican that replaced a Democrat. Every single person we hired is a capable, competent person. We've never had a political hire. So subsequently, we were able to get more done with 109 employees than they used to get done with 176. Because you bring in that institutional knowledge and do what needs to be done. I, I tell you, when I brought in Steve Tinsley, he used to work for the auditor's office. Went to work for him in 1983. He said he walked through the door when he first walked, went to work there. There was people everywhere. And he asked the guy, said, how many people work here? The guy looked at him and said, about half. And he said, that was the truth. Because it was such a political, you know, uh, they would bring all their political buddies in. But I would tell you right now, the problem we're facing in the state of Oklahoma is a financial problem. And who better than a CPA and an auditor that knows how to fix it? I can tell you right now, I didn't grow up wanting to be governor. I prayed that somebody would literally jump in this race that truly understood what the problem was, knew how to fix it, and had the intestinal fortitude to do that. But too many times we make decisions based on politics, not about what's good for the state of Oklahoma. And let me, uh, let me tell you, as far as economic growth, we have to have economic growth and development if we're going to survive, but we have to fix our problems first. You know, for years we've heard, you know, we've seen teachers leaving the state, and companies are saying, if you, can't, if you can't keep schools open five days a week, if you can't keep your teachers, why do we want to come to Oklahoma? And there at the Capitol, the uh, back and forth victory, and I said the biggest problem at the Capitol is that Republicans and Democrats don't trust each other. Republicans within their own caucus don't trust each other. The House and Senate doesn't trust each other, and nobody trusts the governor and her staff. So three different times they passed a bill to get teacher the pay raise. There was the A-plus plan two years ago. There was a step-up plan that many of you are familiar with. When it failed, I was walking down the hall talking to a Democrat state rep, and I said, what if we did this? Instead of this huge conglomeration of things pulled together, why don't we make it simple? Let's do 5% gross production tax, which I've said that should have never gone down to two. It did because politicians got behind closed doors with their major donors and developed policy, and nobody was there representing Oklahomans. So let's make it 5%. Let's do a 75 cent tax on cigarettes. And they were pushing a six cent tax on gasoline and six cent tax on diesel. I said, why don't we lower the six to three on gasoline and six on diesel makes it 20 across the board, same as Texas. That'll be enough money to fund the teacher pay raise, low priced employees, and put some money into health care. And the rep told me, he said, you know what? I like that. The next day they called me and said, we're going to go for your plan. And so ultimately that became the plan because I brought Democrats and Republicans together to get it done. So the challenges we're facing right now in funding is the fact that we've cut revenue streams by $2 billion over the last 10 years. Income tax used to be seven, it's down to five. Every quarter cent reduction is $160 million. So while these people want to tell you that we can cut, 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 folks, there is some inefficiencies in government. I'm the one that can find it. But, but we can't starve the beast to death or starve our government to death. 
and not have health services, not have education. And my time's up, and I'd be glad to answer any questions you have afterwards. Thank you very much. I just want to let you know before I say this, Gary's are actually very smart people, but actually it was Senator Connie Johnson's turn. <laughs> Okay, sounds good. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to introduce uh, former Senator Connie Johnson. She's a Democrat running for governor. Connie? Thank you, Gary, and good afternoon, Oklahoma City Metropolitan Association of Realtors. I'm Senator Connie Johnson, and I'm running to be governor of Oklahoma. And I'm asking for your vote. I want to spend the next couple of minutes sharing with you who I am, why I am, how that relates to who you are, and where we are as a state. It would be difficult, if not impossible, as you can see from my predecessors, to try to really sum up everything about what's going on politically in this state in four minutes. I mean, it has taken us 20 years to get here, so I seriously doubt that not even four minutes or four years are going to be enough to reverse our course. But in this moment, I am from Oklahoma. I'm a native Oklahoma, born in Holdenville, grew up in southeastern Oklahoma in the heart of Little Dixie, Idaville. Moved to Oklahoma City when, we, when I was six years old. My parents were public school educators. I attended public schools in northeast Oklahoma City, going to Creston Hills, Kennedy Junior High, and finally yes, the oldest public high school in the state. Douglas High School. I graduated in 1970, earned a full scholarship to the University of Pennsylvania, where I grew my advocacy and my activism, uh, and came back to Oklahoma and raised a family and started working with the state senate in 1981 as the only African American on staff actually writing legislation on the issues that most impact people, including health care, education, mental health, environment, and of course, um, well-being, child well-being. So what I'm saying to you today is that I have grown and I have written about everything that I have ever lived. My mom actually was a teacher who subsidized her income as a real estate agent. And realtors in my heart, in the memory of Mrs. Aberdeen Pointer, a black female broker, perhaps the first one in Oklahoma City who built the Aberdeen Apartments over on 10th Street. When we moved to Oklahoma City, it was at the point where the color line was at 23rd. And you know that has a real impact on how communities develop. You're familiar with redlining and the impact that that has on different communities disproportionately. So I want to talk to you not only about my love for what you do as a profession and how your profession actually made my life possible, but I want to talk about the challenges and the opportunities that we have in this moment when we're challenged with not having enough money, with cutting too many taxes, with treating different entities differently, and not really stepping up and taking care of the people. When we don't take care of all of us, we end up paying for us. So the challenges to us and to you as realtors is to recognize that there are a variety of communities in this city in particular, and, and, and downtown is nice. We've seen a lot of growth and development going on for uh, millennials, for the younger families who are wanting to live in a more metropolitan area. It's beautiful what is happening downtown. I want to say that there are challenges just to the east of you, though, when it comes to developing housing options for older people who are aging out. My 87-year-old mother would have loved to age in place in a space that she was comfortable with. But because of our practices, those types of opportunities are limited, and that is, I believe, what we are having a challenge and what we must do. In order to fund this, I'm the one, the only one that's going to talk to you about the new sources of revenue that can come with changing our policies about wind and solar and cannabis. Let's tax wind, solar, and gross and, and oil and gas the same. And then let's look at the revenues. Let's look at the housing boom that's going on in Colorado because of the ridiculous amounts of money that are coming from regulating an industry that happens to grow between the cracks of the concrete in Oklahoma. I'm happy to talk to you further about it. Thank you so much.
Next, we have current Lieutenant Governor, Todd Lane. Todd? Gary, uh, thank you very much for uh, introducing me and thanks for the invitation to be with you today. Uh, my name is Todd Lamb. I want to be here today not to talk about my campaign for governor, but to also thank this association. Uh, you have been supportive of every race in which I've been a candidate. And Kathy Fowler was in my office so much when I was in the state senate, she started picking up her mail in my office when I was in the Oakland state senate. Kathy, thanks for your friendship and your leadership. Uh, we're excited also that Chuck Perry, not all of us remember the Oklahoma City Metro uh, Realtor Association, he's a realtor in Grove. Uh, he endorsed our candidacy today because of my commitment to work with realtors throughout my career. I've also done that personally. My wife Monica and I have been married for 22 years. We've moved five times. You're welcome. <laughs> Monica loves moving, and I love being married to Monica. When she packs a box, I pack a box. So thank you for what you've done for our family personally over the years. Many of you know my background uh, in public policy because we work together. Some know my background in the private sector, whether it's in uh, land brokerage as a petroleum land man or in wireless telecom, but also have a background in law enforcement. Some of you may know that. I'm a former special agent with the United States Secret Service. Uh, I say that to make this point. When I was in the Secret Service, my supervisors never slid a gun across the table in my direction and said, the president is going to such and such city. Why don't you head over there and see what you can do to help? I went through a five and a half month rigorous academy. Every assignment I had, every assignment I had in the United States Secret Service required detailed planning and detailed backup planning, if you can only imagine. Oklahoma is in much of the mire we are in because we have no plan. Proverbs 29, verse 18, I know this is not Sunday school, but in Proverbs 29, verse 18 says, where there is no vision, the people will perish. Amen, right back there. Another translation says, or the people will be confused or scattered. Our people are confused and scattered because we have no plan. As a former Secret Services agent, I have a detailed plan for Oklahoma. Here's a 30,000 foot view, no time for details, but 30,000 foot view. My goal is to renew Oklahoma, R-E-N-E-W, our reform and restructure state government, starting with the budget process. E, education funding, but couple and cloak with reform. N stands for neighborhoods, a 77 county focus for unique challenges we have all across Oklahoma. The second E, E and renew stands for economic diversification, and then W stands for work. Oklahoma is not working. We must get our, our citizens back to work. We must make government work for our people. Now, the two questions that we were asked to touch on. I have a detailed plan on how to get to zero-based budgeting in Oklahoma. Right now, our budget is negotiated by five legislators in a closed room for three and a half months with two weeks to go every session. That door opens up, light shines on the budget, and the rest of the legislature is forced to vote on that budget. That's not a good use of taxpayer money or a wise way to appropriate taxpayer money. I have, I have a plan to get that out in the open, use our existing committee and subcommittee structure, holding unelected bureaucrats accountable for how they appropriate and spend taxpayer money every year and make them accountable for their very existence, i.e. zero-based budgeting, a very detailed plan. Education funding. My plan as governor and a government administration is require a minimum of 65% of the education dollar to go in the classroom, where the teachers are for teacher pay, new textbooks, and new whiteboard technology. I've got 27 seconds left to talk about how to diversify Oklahoma's economy. Listen fast. As governor of Oklahoma, I'll appoint the first secretary of international trade to focus on the commodities we make and fabricate in Oklahoma to export those to countries like Taiwan, 20 million, United Kingdom, 65 million, that's 90 million mouths to feed, backs to clothe, and consumers that need things. Thank you for your past support, and I hope to have your support in this race. Thank you for your support. All right. So next, we have a Libertarian candidate. When we set up the format, we didn't think we'd be able to have 15 candidates, but somehow it worked out for Rex that he was able to get here and join the group. So ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to introduce Rex Lex Longhorn. Hi everyone. 
uh, this is going to be a historic election in the state of Oklahoma. It's the first time in Oklahoma history you've had, hit Oklahoma history that you've had a libertarian on the ballot. We uh, achieved ballot access in 2016. Gary Johnson, you may recall, he was your presidential candidate. And Oklahoma was the fourth largest vote total percentage-wise for in the country for a libertarian presidential candidate. And there's a very simple reason for that. Oklahomans are libertarian. We want to be able to engage in our lives without the interference of other people. And libertarians believe that that's how everybody should be able to live their lives on the conditions that you don't hurt anybody else. So this is going to be the first opportunity that you've had to vote for real change in state history. I was born in Kansas, southeast Kansas, raised in a farm town, uh, Parsons. I traveled all over the world. I joined the Air Force, traveled in the Air Force for two years, uh, came back in telecommunications, and had to travel the country because you go where the work is, right? Um, if you don't have a market where you are, you've got to go to where the market is. So that took me all over the country. So I've seen a lot of what happens in the different states and the different government structures that take place. I've been working in policy for 20 years. Most recently, I was on Gary Johnson's policy team. Uh, in the year 2015, 2016, my most recent policy work was working to get the ballot access laws changed. Historically, the state of Oklahoma required a new party to achieve 10% in the election in order to retain their ballot access. If their presidential or gubernatorial candidate didn't achieve 10%, they fell off the ballot. Well, you guys know it takes a long time to build a market. It takes a long time to build notoriety, name recognition, understanding for what you stand for. And you can't do that in one election cycle. You can't reach 2.1 million voters when you have no base. Uh, we built that base last time and we are doing it better and we are looking for some real victories here. No matter what happens in this election, the Libertarian Party and therefore the people of Oklahoma are going to win because it's the policies have already been changing. They're already making the changes. I'm going to address the two questions that you asked for us. The first one is about economic expansion. And there's a lot of talk about that. Everybody's talking about how much, how many of the commodities we make, you know, how uh, bountiful we are in our agriculture and our raw materials. Number one producer of gypsum in the world. Number two producer of iodine in the United States. But here's the issue. We already export everything that we produce. And it's all raw materials. We need to have businesses in the state of Oklahoma that utilize our raw materials to produce consumer goods. Then we can talk about exporting them to everywhere else. The only way we can do that is if the government starts focusing on its core structure. We need infrastructure. We need education. We need housing. And we need a place that employees are comfortable living. If the employees aren't comfortable, the companies won't move here. Because that's the number one thing that they consider when they are choosing where they're going to move. Am I going to be able to attract and keep quality talent? Quality talent moves to good school systems. Quality talent moves to good infrastructure. Quality talent moves to places with a lot of entertainment opportunity. The reason that Oklahoma hasn't had economic expansion up to this point are twofold. One, the tax structure's been bad. I'm about out of time already, so let me just move on to the education question because everything, by focusing on education, we're going to have economic development. And in order to fund education, we need to have economic development. We spend $12,700 per student right now. That doesn't put us at the bottom of the list. The problem is that we're spending it all on administration and we're spending it all on current contracts because of a lot of corruption that takes place at the local level because we don't have the state oversight of how the spending is being done. If we do that, I've already identified $2.4 billion that's in the Oklahoma budget that we could eliminate and not a single Oklahoman would feel the effects of that except for those who are getting that correct money. I'm out of time. If you want to talk to me more about it later on, please find me. I'll be around. Thank you. Okay. Next on our program is Tulsa businessman and old man Gary Richardson. Gary? Thank you very much for being here today and uh, giving us the opportunity to come and visit with you. My wife, Elena, spent her years as a mortgage broker uh, in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and her daughter, Christy, is in the real estate business, so I have some familiarity with, with your business. And uh, a little bit about my background, I was born in Caddo, Oklahoma, grew up in deep south Texas on a cotton farm, came back to 
college at Bethany Nazarene College. My twin sister and I did. Then I became, at some point in my career, a uh, an assistant insurance commissioner for the state of Oklahoma. At that time, I had got my law degree going to night school. And after that, I became assistant state prosecutor in Muskogee, Oklahoma. And then after that, I became the, I was appointed U.S. Attorney for the Eastern District of Oklahoma by President Ronald Reagan. I was I took the job and was asked to take the job to handle the county commissioner scandal in our, in our state, which happened to be the largest corrupt, corruption scandal in the nation at the time, and as far as I know, still is. So I've had some experience with dealing with tough situations and with corruption. And I say today that our state is suffering from, number one, waste, food spending, and corruption. I do believe that. You know, when we handled the county commissioner problems, people thought there's no way they could be stealing from the very people they serve, but they were. These were pillar folks that were pillars of their community. Church-going people, married people, highly respected, yet they were stealing from the very people they served, and it wasn't just a 10% kickback. There were some that were turning in fake receipts for heavy equipment that never was purchased, or for bridges that never were built. So it was far more than the 10%. And as to the questions, I say as to economic growth, we first have to shift our focus from corporate welfare to developing the infrastructure in our state. I think a good example of that is the windmill. Look how much money we gave them for tax credits. They didn't come. They didn't start coming until we built the infrastructure. We have wind in Oklahoma. We didn't have to buy them, <laughs> believe me. They wanted the wind we have in Oklahoma, and we have plenty of it, right? But we bought them. They still didn't come. And then we did some infrastructure. Well, they're still coming even though there are no tax credits today. So that shows how foolish we were and how wasteful we were in that situation. Another situation is the turnbacks. Look between Oklahoma City and, and Tulsa and tell me how much economic development you see. Then go to Joplin. A dwindling city, 30 miles further into Arkansas. Miami's the dwindling city in, in, in uh, Oklahoma. 30 miles further, Joplin has unbelievable economic development. Restaurants, truck stops. I mean, these turnpikes are killing our state. Like, Cancer slowly destroys the body. I have a five-year plan to take the toll gates down. It's on my website, GaryRichardson.org. I will tell you there's economic study, and there was a study done in the state of Oklahoma commissioned by our governor at the time. In 1995, on the highway system in Oklahoma, we were told clearly at that time to take the toll gates down, and they gave the reasons why it would save our state millions of dollars a year. So I have a three-part plan. Number one, put a turnpike under road dot. Number two, quit issuing bonds. Number three, use the income from the turnpikes and the $100 million the turnpike has to keep in the account, and we pay off the turnpikes in five years. Is my time up? My gosh. I just got started. <laughs> Okay. Next on our list of candidates is someone that is some our profession as a mortgage lender. Ladies and gentlemen, from Tulsa, Oklahoma, Kevin Stitt. Thank you guys so much for, for having me here. Um, I'm the CEO of Gateway Mortgage Group. So I love your industry. I thought we might be, uh, you know, reviewing HUD ones or something when I got here today. Uh, anyway, I'll tell you my story. I'm not a politician. Um, grew up in Norman. Dad was a pastor there, and then uh, I did not want to go to school in the same hometown I grew up in, so I ended up going to school in Stillwater. So I went to Oklahoma State. Well. Thank 
thank you. I either get go pokes there or when I'm in Norman, they say, oh, I'm sorry, you couldn't get into OU. So one of the two responses. Or Boomer, I hear that. Uh, so I got an accounting degree from, uh, from OSU and, um, you know, I've always wanted to have my own business. I've always been entrepreneurial. So I moved to Tulsa, met my wife, Sarah. We've been married now to be 20 years in May. We have six children from 17 down to four. So three boys and three girls. Uh, busy around the house and then I got into the mortgage business shortly after college uh, calling on all you folks and uh, did that for a couple years and then I started my company Gateway Mortgage Group with a thousand dollars in the computer now today we employ 1200 people we have uh, we do business in 41 states uh, we have about 165 offices so we have office here in uh, Oklahoma City we're actually sponsoring the the golf uh, I think your golf uh, event you're gonna have in a couple weeks I called our branch manager and I said where are you at, man? Why aren't you here calling all these realtors? Um, anyway, he's adopting a child, and so uh, he, he couldn't make it today. But we have an office in Edmond and also in Norman. So that's just been my whole world the last 18 years. It's been all about hiring people smarter than me, putting them in the right positions, leading, setting the vision and the strategy. So why am I running for governor? You know, I'm running for governor because I'm so frustrated with how our state's being run. Uh, I travel to Texas all the time. I visit our offices there, and I see all this momentum and job creation, positivity, growth coming out of that market. And then I will go to visit our offices in Arkansas and Colorado and Tennessee, and there's just tremendous momentum all around our state. Then I come back to Oklahoma, the state that I love, that I grew up in, and I just feel like we're down in the dumps a little bit. You know, we haven't had the growth that the other states have had. And then, then we're going to four-day school weeks in 20% of the school districts. Uh, we've been dealing with this budget problem for the last five years. And then I look, okay, who's going to lead us out? Who's running for governor? When I look and see who's running, it just looks like more of the same to me. Just the career politicians running for their next election. I truly believe we're going to be in the same situation eight years from now if we keep electing the same folks. That's why I'm running for governor. I want to take off from my company. I want to go serve my state. Focus on the next generation and not the next election. You have to have a leader that's focused on breaking through the silos. As CEO, I can't be just in love with my risk group or just my IT or my sales. You've got to think about moving the whole team forward. That's the kind of governor I'm going to be. I'm going to be focused on all 4 million Oklahomans moving our whole state forward, regardless of this industry or this special interest group or this entrenched interest. Uh, so I think that's it, that the governor's job to kind of set the big vision, uh, put the plan together, hire the right people. So, uh, you know, the, what I think about growth, I think a lot of it is blocking and tackling. I, I look at what's happening nationally. Uh, you know, Trump just cut the corporate tax rate from 35 to 21. That was a huge deal, all right? If you'd have told me he could have done it, I'd have said there's no way. Well, if you'd have told me who's going to get elected, I would have said there was no way. Uh, but that just kind of leveled the playing field internationally. So now there's a move to repatriate dollars. There's a move to bring manufacturing back to the U.S. We have a tremendous opportunity in Oklahoma over the next 10 years to capture that growth. All right? We've got the land, the natural resources. There's no better state with a better location than Oklahoma. We are dead center in the U.S., but it's going to take an outsider. It's going to take a business person, somebody that can talk to CEOs to get our state growing again to move us forward. My time is up. I am so sorry. All right. Great to be with you guys. Thank you all so much. We're going to skip from up here dot com. Okay. We're going to do the one last question. And what we're going to do is we're going to take the microphone around to the candidates. And we'll start with you, Kevin, once uh, Glenn is ready to come up here. But we wanted to give uh, Mayor Cornette an opportunity to make his presentation, even though he wasn't here. I was told we figured that out. And we're working on that. Okay. But before we do that, the one thing that I do want to talk about for just two minutes is that uh, Jared talked a little bit about being a major investor. And the importance of being a major investor and giving $1,000 or more to our political action committee is important. While we challenge every realtor to give their $20, what we call fair share, we know that in order to have the necessary funds to do the things we need to do, that it takes some other folks to give more, and we have people that do that. As part of our major investor program, we get this wonderful, wonderful jacket. And there's some major investors here. They just came in this week that I'd like to present you with your jacket while I'm here. Aww. And if you'll come up, starting with Kathy Bauer. 
<laughs> major investor. Okay. Next, Kelly Heaton, major investor. And while Kelly's coming up, Jared Kennedy, major investor. slide in, those two minutes are yours. Are we ready, Glenn? Come forth. Ladies and gentlemen, our Government Affairs Chair, Glenn Cosper. Thank you. Uh, let's just give them all the candidates a round of applause, because it takes a lot from the families and the first situation to, to put forth the line for public office. So my question to you is, we have a, uh, we're in the relationship business as realtors. A lot of our families or our clients uh, have uh, had the experience with uh, people in their families or, or our clients in mental, mental illness. And we'd like to know what you'd like to do uh, if you're elected governor to try to, to help uh, solve that problem in Oklahoma. We have a big problem with, with uh, mental illness and homelessness. Thank you, Glenn. Starting with Ken. So, I guess you start the time. Um, Ready, Vanessa? Mm -hmm. So, it, it, is a, uh, it is a huge problem. You know, Medicaid is also a huge problem in our state. And we've seen Medicaid rolls go from 500,000 up to a million. We've got to re audit those rolls so we can take care of the people that actually need it. We need to get the people off of our system that should not be on it. And I have five pillars that I run my company with, and I think about leading the state. You need a health plan as one of those. Under my health plan, you know, part of my job as, uh, as governor is to lead. Uh, and I want to go to all 77 counties because some of this stuff 
can't be fixed with new laws in Oklahoma City or Washington, D.C. So I want to go to every single county and bring the community leaders and the pastors together. And as a pastor's son, I know the denominational differences that sometimes divide us, but I can come together as a county and we can say, hey, let's solve this problem on a county level. Here's the mental numbers, mental illness numbers. Here's the high school dropouts. Here's the foster care numbers. Here's the social issues we deal with in our counties. And we can come together as a county and solve these much better than Oklahoma City can. Thank you. Gary, you're next. Thank you very much. One of the problems we have in our state, and I think this is probably not just in Oklahoma, but other states, is 55% of the people that we put in prison are there because of mental illness or addictions. We need to have alternative programs for these folks. The cost to put them in prison is $23,000 a year. Imagine that with all the people we have in prison today. We're number one in the nation. Thailand is the number one country in the world. We imprison twice as many women in Oklahoma as Thailand does per capita. It's killing us. So alternative programs for mental illness other than put them in the penitentiary is the answer. It costs about $5,000 a year for alternative programs. So 23,000 versus 5,000. Also, and this is extremely important, the alternative programs are far more effective. Far more effective. They're able to get these folks back into the community. They're able to re-establish re, uh, themselves as a profitable person to our state. They get employment, they pay taxes, but you send them to prison, pretty much their life's over and they become a burden to our state. I'm a former state prosecutor, as I, you know, and a former U.S. attorney. I've dealt with these issues. I've also represented the death of a person that was killed in, in the private prison in Lawton because of mental illness. He, he got a head injury in the oil field. He ends up in penitentiary because he was arrested and they found a, a razor blade in his Bible. So they charged him with that, put him in penitentiary. He had about a 12th grade mentality. He died in prison, in prison because they put a man in a cell with him that killed him. Long story short, it happened just like that, and the jury rewarded him with $6.5 million because it was that bad. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Rex? This is an issue that touches my family personally. I've got two relatives that have had to deal with the criminal justice system and also with the mental health and which wound up in the criminal justice system. Um, this is an issue that we all know the answer to. The answer is not to put them in jail. Everybody knows that, but for some reason that hasn't quite made it to the legislature yet to get them to change the laws to make it happen. I echo everything that Kevin said. This is best handled by the communities, the people that know the people that have mental health issues, addiction issues, that struggle with them. Those are the people where they get the greatest support and those are the people that have the best opportunity to make their productive members of the society again. I, did, I agree with Gary Richardson. Uh, we need to keep them out of the prison system because prison is not a place to house mental illness. We need to stop putting people in jail that we don't like and start putting people in jail that we're afraid of. Uh, there's one step further that we need to take though. We need to address these issues at an early age. We need to keep them out of that pipeline altogether. And part of that comes from the education system. There are two avenues that we can look at through the education system. One of them is having better mental health awareness at the young level, catch them when they're tiny, and start giving them the ability that they need to be functioning members of society so they're not pushed either into the drugs to deal with their issues and their rejection or to deal with the other mental health issues that keeps them out of the workforce. Um, I've got a nephew that is wheelchair bound. My uh, sister happens to be wealthy, so she had the opportunity 
to put him into private programs that are not available to the general population. We need to be able to echo that in the public sentiment. And we've got 19,000 nonprofit organizations in the state of Oklahoma that can provide that opportunities. The second thing is a lot of these people that have mental health issues are never going to go into college. They're not going to be our scientists and doctors, but they still want to be able to produce in society. So we need to start looking at introducing Swiss style apprenticeships into the high school where at the 10th grade level, they can start working for a company and get their high school credit through that. They are being trained for a job, they're getting their experience that's necessary so they can get out of school and move forward productive and not in jail. Thank you, Rex. Thank you, Gary. We must address mental health in this, in this way. Criminal justice reform and any effort must be fully integrated. Uh, candidates be candidate by county must be fully integrated. It's a problem right now. So Harmon County is not worried about Canadian County. Garfield County is not worried about Texas County. Cimarron County is not worried about Ottawa County. It must be a fully integrated opportunity. And I'll prove it in this area. When I was in the Oklahoma State Senate, I authored a pilot program that focused on the nonviolent offender, the female nonviolent offender. It's a pilot program to see if it would work. And those that suffer from mental health were, were able to participate in this program. It got these women reduced recidivism, changed lives, changed families, and broke cycles in Oklahoma. The Medicaid issue touches on this in Oklahoma. We have over one out of four of, of, of all Oklahomans are on Medicaid. Last year, over 52% of all the births in Oklahoma were Medicaid babies. We have a funding problem in Oklahoma. In 2001, 71 cents of every dollar was Medicaid, was federal. Presently, 58 cents of every dollar is federal in Oklahoma. With a new reevaluation by the end of the year, that 58 cents should go to 62 cents. If Medicaid funding alone remains the same, and I think we'll increase this year, but it remains the same, there'll be 94 million new monies for nursing homes, 50 million new monies for those entities that treat and serve those with mental health. But back to my reform restructuring the budget process. We've got to hold unelected bureaucrats accountable and restructure the budget and focus in a very open process with the committee and subcommittee structure that I talked about already to prioritize and remove silos in state government because the Department of Veterans Affairs deals with mental health. Criminal justice deals with mental health. Department of Human Services deals with mental health. It's too siloed in Oklahoma and it does not serve those who need it the most the best and that we were formed in a government administration. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Gary, we're going to the order this time. The budget process in the legislature is flawed, and it's mainly flawed because the budget's done by politicians. And the average term of a politician right now in the Capitol is five years. What we need is a true budget office where we have to run by professionals. And we, right now we have the House does a budget, the Senate does a budget, and the Governor's Office does a budget. You have three different sets of numbers, at least two of them are wrong. What we need is a group of professionals that handle the budget and presents that information. And I will tell you, one of the biggest problems we have right now is the fact that, that we're not, they're not listening to the professionals. The politicians are micromanaging things to the level that they're not delivering the services the way they should. You listen to mental health and you listen to corrections. We did an audit on corrections and basically said you need to fix the problems with, with drug and alcohol treatment. You need to you need to put programs in that gives them a profession coming out that, that's different than the one they had going in. What they do though is they ignore that. In fact, there was an audit done in 2000, well, 13 years ago by a company called MTG, it cost $900,000. They recommended that the legislature spend $10 million to address specific problems. What they said was, we don't have $10 million, so they put it on the shelf. Five years later, we did an audit of the Department of Corrections and said, you need to fix your problems. Your guards are underpaid. You don't have enough of them. Your facilities are crumbling. Your computer systems are antiquated. You don't have the treatment programs. You need to look at, at the idea of have these programs in place that, that give people the treatment and have the, out, uh, uh, the programs where they don't go in, but they're monitored. What do they do? Because it takes money, they ignore it. What we have to do is have somebody that's willing to address those problems, because if we don't start working on fixing those problems, they're going to continue to get worse and worse, and that's what's happened. That's why you have to have somebody that truly understands. You know, if someone says audit everything, well, what you need to know is what to audit, and also know what you do with those results of those audits, because that's where you can truly make a difference. So, thank you.
thank you. Thank you all again for the opportunity to be here today. Really quickly, Oklahoma is a state of traumatized people. That's just our reality from the beginning of the land run all the way through teachers being traumatized last two weeks with what the legislature said to them when they came. So the reality is that mental health will surpass physical health in terms of the policy needs in the very near future. Our problem is still going to be how will we pay for them. I want to make a plug for you to vote for State Question 788, legalizing medical cannabis. Revising our cannabis policies can not only heal our state emotionally and physically, it helps people get off of opioid addictions. It literally helps people who are suffering from cancer. It keeps veterans from co committing suicide at the rate of 22 a day nationally and children dying from epilepsy. It simply takes courage for us as a state to acknowledge that we've been given a substance that can turn our state around, turn our budget around, solve our mental health problems, fund education, fund pay wages for teachers, pay wages for teachers that are greater than 6,000 because they're leaving for 20,000. I'm asking you today, consider that question, but also consider the only person who is going to, well, maybe Rex, the only person who's going to ensure that that policy can go forward and reap the benefits to Oklahoma that we deserve as the nation's leading world production state in World War II. It grows between the cracks of the concrete here. Turn our state around, accept the reality that we have some new sources of funding, wind, solar, and cannabis that we are not addressing. And until we do, anyone who talks about anything else, tax cuts, gross production tax, restoring this, sin tax that, is being disingenuous about what it's gonna take to truly turn this state around. Thank you very much. Visit me at ConnieForGovernor.com. I hope you get to talk to you. And then candidates, if you would, uh, the media has asked if we could have a group picture towards the end. So when Drew finishes his comments, if you guys can work it, we appreciate it. The question was how we're going to handle mental health in the state of Oklahoma and what we intend to do about it. A couple of things right off the bat. Number one, we've got to make sure that mental health is on parity with physical health in our insurance programs and every other aspect where we're treating medical conditions. Mental health is every bit as important as physical health to your ultimate well-being. Second, I support the Department of Mental Health Smart on Crime proposal which provides for mental health, drug, alcohol treatment facilities available all across the state of Oklahoma. It's going to take some capital investment. It's going to take some investment in that area, but it's going to save us money in the long run because if we have the ability to treat those underlying problems, we can bring down prison population. And the statistics that you've heard are correct. Three to five thousand dollars to treat an underlying problem of drug, alcohol, or mental health. Twenty to thirty thousand dollars to lock somebody up uh, for commission of an offense while under the influence of drugs, alcohol, or a mental health condition. So it just makes sense to do that. I also agree with uh, it may have been Rex, whoever said it's important to be able to spot these issues early on. One of the one of the casualties of the elimination of all of the reforms of House Bill 1017 that we passed back in 1990 was the elimination of counseling positions in our schools. When we passed that reform, we not only boosted teacher salary, we lowered class sizes, we provide for mentor and uh, teaching assistants in every classroom, counselors and, and uh, mental health people in our schools to spot these problems early on. And the earlier you can spot them and deal with them, the more cost effective that it is. I describe myself as a New Testament Democrat, which means I think we're judged in part by how we treat the sick, the elderly, the homeless, and the hungry. And treating a mental health condition is part of that. So thank you for the question. Thank you. Candidates, if you can come up here on the stage. Also, and Helen, right here, uh, photographers, if you will go front, face that way, straight line across, shoulder to shoulder. 
step up to the front. Don't be shy. I've never known a politician to be shy. Squeeze in there. Okay, shoulder to shoulder. so very much. Let's give them another big round of applause. They've done an excellent job. Thank you. We had a phenomenal program. Again, is I know you guys get tired of this, but our political action committee could use the support. And last but not least, I need volunteers for the phone -thon. The sign-in sheet is outside. Please sign up if you can give us a couple of hours on May the 2nd. And without any, oh, we'll give you pizza. <laughs> you really made me say that. Okay. Without any further ado, our executive director, Helen Bosman. <laughs> I think we're going to meet somewhere, so I don't know if it's just me. But, uh, you know, I've got to say that it is very true. We do have all these issues in Oklahoma, and I'm so excited to see everyone talking about it and wanting to do something. But I've been here 20 years in September, and it's an amazing state. Thank you. Thank you. So let's not forget that, but it's great. And i got to tell you, I can sort out the economic issue in the state. If other English people know how cheap real estate is here, you're going to have them here by the plane load. So we're going to factor that into the budget. Um, now, underneath two chairs in the room is a, is a winning coupon for a lockbox. So I'd like you all to stand on your head, take a look, and uh, we'll find out who's got the winning cards. Oh, a winner! And there should be another one. Yellow? I don't know what that is, Larry, but we'll, we'll give you something. <laughs> I, I think there is. Keep looking. So, thank you so much for coming today. <laughs> I gotta go say hello.